Though this video is about a case that's now over 50 years old, these repercussions still live on to this day, as do many of the people involved at the time and their relatives. It's important when discussing this to be respectful and to remember that we may never know what actually happened in the early morning of June 17 in Patterson, New Jersey. In a bar called the Lafayette Bar and Grill, three people were murdered at around 2.30 a.m. Their names were Jim Oliver, Fred Noyox and Hazel Tannis, and a man named William Marins was also shot. Two men, one armed with a pistol and one armed with a shotgun, had walked into the bar and walked out around 30 seconds later. Two of the witnesses who survived long enough to talk to police and the courts, Hazel Tannis and William Marins respectively, gave descriptions of the perpetrators. A witness from an upstairs window also saw the backs of their heads and the getaway car, which was very distinctive, white with unusual tail lights, and in New York rather than New Jersey for the license plate. The date was June 17th and the time was shortly after 2.30 a.m., which was when the first phone call was made reporting the incident to police. Having mentioned the police, I also have to say that due to the time period, it's relevant to mention that the perpetrators were black and the victims were white. This becomes more relevant as the case goes on, particularly with regards to the perceptions of the police at the time, the perceptions of the media and how they treated the case, and eventually even how the justice system approached the issue. It was time of pronounced racial tension in America, with the civil rights movement and numerous riots occurring in very recent memory. So the crime was provocative, to say the least. At one point, over a 100 officers were assigned to investigate it. And despite this incredible amount of resources, manpower, and the incredible desire that the police had to find those responsible, the people they ended up bringing to court months later had been first arrested and interrogated by the Patterson Police Department less than an hour after the shooting had taken place. The men who were accused were Reuben Hurricane Carter, a famous boxer, and John Arter, who was 19 and about to go to college with a track scholarship. Reuben was 29 at the time. The case would go on to be known worldwide due to a celebrity support campaign in Reuben's favour, featuring Muhammad Ali and the song Hurricane by Bob Dylan. The song itself was what first got me into the case. It was the first time I'd heard of Reuben Carter, of him being falsely tried, thrown in a prison cell when one time he could have been the champion of the world. It's a really good song. If anyone hasn't listened to it, there is a video linked in the description that sounds very good. I didn't really think about it to any greater extent than that until a YouTuber, James Lawrence Alcott uploaded a video to his channel interviewing two people who had made a podcast about the case. This was a bit unusual, most of his content is football based and podcasts of his own and that sort of thing, but I was intrigued and after two references to it in a different video of his, I have since listened to that podcast that those people have made, it's called The Hurricane Tape. If anyone watching this video wants to take a look at the highly in-depth and personal details of the case, as told by those who were there at the time, then I strongly recommend you give it a listen. It features the voices of both Reuben Carter and John Arter. John was still being alive at the time the podcast was made, and Reuben having died in 2014. Since listening to that podcast, I've done some additional research, and I wanted to make this as a way to try and start a bit more of a discussion about the case. There have been so many theories on the over the years, there have been so many people involved, there have been so many twists and turns, and so many different theories from so many different areas. The police still believe that Reuben and John did it, most of them do in any case, as have the prosecution team and some of the victim's family. Some people believe that they were completely innocent, some people believe that they were accomplices. I'll we'll discuss all the possibilities and I hope to really get into the case. But discussing this is always going to be a sensitive topic and any discussions should take place with respect to the victims and their families at the forefront of your mind. First, I want to outline how the police and criminal court 
proceedings against cultural artists proceeded. This segment would have been done in much greater detail by the Hurricane Tapes, so if you want to look at that and get to hear the voices of a lot of people that were involved, then that's completely fine. But I'm going to attempt to summarise it here and break down all the key points. So Reuben and John were pulled over in Reuben's car shortly after the shooting. They were on their way back from a bar called The Night Spot, where John had been dancing and Reuben had been drinking. Though it was Reuben's car, John was driving. Another friend of Reuben's, John Bucks Royster, was also in the car, though he was blackout drunk at the time and not in a very good state. As there were three people in the car and police were looking for two, they were released and went on with their journey. John and Reuben, having dropped Royster off, were later picked up again the same night. This time, more details about the car were known, and as the getaway vehicle's description matched the description of Reuben's car, they were pulled over and taken to a spot near the Lafayette, before subsequently being taken to the police station. They tried to establish timelines for both men's nights. They administered lie detector tests, which we'll come back to later, as they've been quite controversial following that night, and according to John, they brought him bullets that they claimed to have found in Reuben's car. He said that he believed that they wanted to get his fingerprints on to the casings, and he didn't touch them. During this time, clean-up was taking place at the bar. The two people who had survived, Hazel Tannis and William Marins, had both been taken to the hospital, but the investigative work at the bar was subpar. Though there was a lot of blood at the scene, one member of the ambulance crew was said to have slipped in it. Shoe marks from the murderers were not looked for and not found. Fingerprints on cartridges were also not searched for. A mistake believer of artists may believe police later tried to rectify. To be fair to the police, saving lives was probably their priority at that point, and it was clearly a stressful situation. However, to be fair to those who would call these missteps incompetence, the first responder on the scene had also been the first responder at a shooting in a bar just the day before, and preserving evidence and the sanctity of a scene is literally a part of the police's jobs. Just going back to the lie detector tests quickly, the reason for the controversy is because it isn't certain whether they passed or not. I'm not saying that if they passed, they're not guilty, but the controversy serves to illustrate the nature of the case as one with so many different viewpoints that it's hard to really know where you stand on any of them. The lie detectors are a small point that illustrate the greater point. The creators of the Hurricane Tapes found information in files belonging to Detective Vincent De Simone on the case that stated that Reuben and John had passed the polygraph, though the report filed by the person who administered the polygraph to them stated that they had both failed. Again, just a small point that illustrates the greater one. An example of this greater point is the testimony of William Marins. He was visited by the police while he was in hospital, with Carter and Artis in tow, and they asked him if the two were the men who shot him, which he denied. He lived long enough to testify in the 1967 trial, but died in 1973 and was unavailable, therefore, for the retrial in 1976. Strangely, when he did testify in court, he stated that he had been in no fit state to tell whether or not these were the men who had shot him at the time when he was in hospital. However, the lawyer for the defence found information indicating that he had later said that it was not them in a subsequent interview as well. So, again, multiple perspectives on the same information from the same person. There was a similar situation with the testimony and descriptions given by Hazel Tannis. Police claimed that they showed Hazel Tannis a series of photos of several men who could have been the perpetrators and asked her to identify them. These photos included pictures of Carter and Artis, and she did not pick them out as the shooters, according to the police. But again, to come in and confuse the situation there, years afterwards, Hazel Tannis' daughter claimed that she had, in fact, identified Carter and Artis from the photos. So you can see that the level of confusion and misinformation going around is 
frankly incredible, and I don't even know how to begin to unpick it. During the questioning of the two men, a bullet and a shotgun shell were found in the car, though they were not logged as evidence until multiple days afterwards. Though Carter was a gun enthusiast, he claimed not to have seen this particular ammunition before, and has since stated that he believes that it was planted by the police. The bullets found in the car were the same calibre as those that had been used in the shooting, but were not from the same manufacturer. So they could have been fired out of the same gun, but they wouldn't have come from the same packet of ammunition. So neither of the murder weapons used were found. Carter and Artis were released from interrogation as police believed they didn't have enough evidence to be able to tell that it was them. But four months later, as the search for new leads went cold and a $12,500 reward went up, more evidence came forwards in the form of a criminal named Alfred Bella. He claimed that he had been the lookout at a robbery taking place down the street with an accomplice of his, Arthur Dexter Bradley. He claimed he wandered away from his lookout position, so not even a good criminal then, and over to the Lafayette Bar and Grill. During a recorded interview between Alfred Bellow and Detective Vincent De Simone, the following exchange took place. Before this exchange, Bellow stated that he had not been able to identify the men that he'd seen. I'm going to read it out because I can't remember it off the top of my head. So the interview asks Al about his parole officer. He asks, is he a white man? Al replies, coloured. You see why I ask you this, Al? I'm interested in your welfare. He goes on to say, if I get the truth from you, not the truth to make me happy, but what's really the truth, I guarantee you in return, I'll do everything possible you. I will go to the top people in New Jersey. He talks about even ignoring what Bellow saw at the bar. If he said he was in the area for anything like robbery or burglary, he could guarantee that nothing would be done on that. The implication is of protection from outside threat, protection from the higher ups, protection from prosecution. The detective makes promises. He says, I guarantee you in return I will do everything possible to protect you. He hears a man tell him he didn't know who he saw, he couldn't tell you who he saw. He makes the man a guarantee, and then here's a name. That name was Reuben Carter. Bellow eventually ended up testifying to this story in court and he embellished it somewhat with a few flourishes that make sure that it doesn't exactly stand up to more reliable witness testimony such as that of Patty Valentine, as we'll see later. Bellow's accomplice, Bradley, also testified. He testified that Bellow had come back and told him Reuben Carter shut up the whole bar. However, given the context of the previous interview, it's important to note that we don't have any transcripts or any records of what was said in interview with Bradley, and that when a man, around a decade later, came to him and told him that he didn't get what he'd been promised, he agreed to recant his previous testimony. Now it's possible that the way I framed these events doesn't seem fair, but I don't think it would be fair on two possibly entirely innocent men to overlook the untrustworthy nature of both some of their main accusers and the circumstances under which their accusations were obtained. In court, the source of the bullets was called into question, but that wouldn't go on to become the most contentious issue. The veracity of Bellow and Bradley's testimony was highly implausible. The story Bellow actually told in court involved the men coming out of the bar, seeing him and chasing him. Him outrunning them and taking a turn down the nearby street, which turned out to be a dead end. The distance when it was measured of that street to that dead end, was 120 yards. Bellow, a short man in not the best physical condition, was claiming to have outrun two highly trained athletes with guns over a considerable distance. Now, for context, 120 yards is the length of a hurdles race, and John Artis could run the 120 yard hurdles in 13.5 seconds. To give you an idea of how good that time was, two years later, in the Mexico Olympic, 
a new world record for 120 yard hurdles was set and that record was 13.3 seconds that 13.5 that John had once run would have gotten him first place at the Tokyo Olympics two years previously the current world record is 12.8 additionally had the murderers seen and chased Bello Patty Valentine's testimony that she had seen the men walk out of the bar and get into the getaway car and then drive away would be completely invalid and those must have been other people which would mean that the car the main connection between Reuben and John and the shooting would then be invalid so at that point you could say that we have two witnesses who had the chance to identify but did not identify Reuben and John and one witness Bellow who claimed to identify them and his compatriot Bradley who backed him up but who if they had seen Reuben and John a major other piece of the puzzle that connected Reuben and John to the case in the first place would make no sense. Bellow's testimony and by extension Bradley's was clearly verifiably unreliable. Some of Reuben's friends testified to his location at the time, including the man who Artis had been driving home in Carter's car, John Bucks Royster. He had been drunk at the time that they were driving him home, and he was also drunk when he showed up to court, which didn't do Reuben's case many favours. Paddy Valentine testified to the identity of the car matching Carter's, and did Bello. Bradley testified to Bello having said that it was Reuben, and the choir brought Dylan though they could not produce the gun. The DA said he was the one who did the deed, and the all-white jury agreed. There were originally 14 jurors, of which 12 were selected to make the verdict. One of the 14 was black, but none of the 12 were. John Artis has stated that as the method of selecting which jurors would go into the room was picking names out of a hat, he saw one of the pieces of paper in that hat was folded and the rest were not. Make of that what you will. The verdict that these jurors decided on was guilty with a recommendation for mercy. Both John and Reuben got life sentences. One juror was heard to say we had them guilty before we even went to the room. The only problem was we didn't want to kill the kid. This kid, John Artis, is the same kid that they had just decided had beyond any reasonable doubt, shot two or three people. Both perpetrators had shot Hazel. The man with the pistol had shot William Marins and Fred Noyles. The man with the shotgun had shot Jim Oliver. They went to prison for nine years. For a man called Fred Hogan from the Public Defender's Office started trying to get a retrial. Recantations were received from Bellow and Bradley and a campaign in the New York Times and through celebrity support was formed to campaign for Reuben's release and, by association, John's. A retrial was secured. Despite his decision to recant his original testimony, Bellow subsequently decided to testify for the prosecution again. He initially told police a new story that he'd been in the bar itself at the time of the shooting, which contradicted all of his previous stories. Police then polygraphed him on each of the stories that he had told and told him that the one that was most true was the one that they believed was most likely to be believed by the court, not the one that he reacted to in the manner that the polygraph thought was most truthful. The story they persuaded him to tell was that he was in the area, that he heard the shots, that he saw the murderers leave, and then that he went in and robbed the cash register. He changed his testimony to this more believable version on hearing that lie prepared. At the time of the retrial, that information hadn't come out, but the information about the recording that I mentioned earlier, when the detective guaranteed him that he would do everything that he could, that had come out. This suggestion of coercion and wrongdoing in a hidden recording was very reminiscent of the recent Nixon scandal and cast a lot of doubt on Bellow's testimony in the minds of the public and, one would think, the jury. One thing that had happened at the first trial was that a motive had not been decided on by the prosecution. This time, they didn't think that they would win without one. So the motive that they assigned to Reuben and John 
became known as the racial revenge theory. The other killing in Patterson the day before that I mentioned earlier, the one that the first responder at the Lafayette had also responded to, had been a case of a white man killing a black man in a bar. Leroy Holloway, the owner, had been shot. The man who had sold him the bar had come in, argued with him about whether or not he had kept up his payments, walked out, and a minute later walked in again and shot him in the head. Leroy Holloway, the owner, was the stepfather of a man called Eddie Rawls, who ran a bar called The Night Spot, which was where John and Reuben had been that night. Rawls was a friend of Reuben's, and they knew each other well. The theory was that the killing of the white people in the bar was revenge for the killing of the black person in the bar, despite the fact that they were completely unrelated people at completely different bars, and the idea that someone's stepson's friend and someone who doesn't know either of them would commit a triple murder in response seems like a stretch to me. Naturally, the defence protested this proposition, saying that the motive could then be ascribed to any black man in Patterson, or indeed any black man, and was not unique to the two who were being put on trial. When the judge questioned the prosecution on this, the prosecution countered that these are guilty men, Your Honour. If we don't ascribe this motive, they'll go free. And the judge accepted the motive. Now, that to me would seem like the judge partly made his decision based on the presupposition of guilt, which is completely ridiculous and unjust and goes against every justice system I think I've ever heard of. Not that I've looked into many in detail, but you know what I mean, it's unjust and wrong. And despite this, a second jury declared that Reuben and John were guilty. They went back to prison. John was released in 1981 after he saved a number of prison guards' lives in a prison riot. As a result, he was released on his first opportunity for parole. Reuben, on the other hand, left prison in 1984 after a writ of habeas corpus plea was upheld. The judge ruled that the second trial had been unconstitutional as the decision had been made in view of racism rather than reason and concealment rather than disclosure. The former in view to the motive assigned and the latter because of the lie told to Bello that resulted in him telling a more believable story. Though the prosecution appealed the verdict of the habeas corpus plea, their appeal was overruled and the appeals court agreed with Judge Sarakin that the decision had been made in view of concealment rather than disclosure, while they declined to comment on the motive. Carter's release was upheld. So that's the story of the police and legal procedurings. But during this time we've only considered two options, that the prosecution are right and that they did it, and that the defence are right and that they didn't. During this time, while they were in prison, a third possibility was being considered. Not that they were innocent, not that they were guilty, but that they were accomplices. Eldridge Hawkins, an attorney, was assigned to investigate the case by Governor Byrne prior to the retrial. 19 pages of his confidential 22-page report were later leaked to the public. They revealed that his investigation interviewed new witnesses and followed a new trail. In the early hours of June 17th, a taxi driver in Patterson picked up a woman from a street called Presidential Boulevard. Two men took her to the cab, though they first went to a black Chevy, which was nearby. She was shaken, crying. She said that there had been shooting and killing, and that someone had given her a gun. She said that she had been carrying it in her purse all night. Her name was Annie Haggins. She was questioned about it eight days later and said that the man called Roosevelt Davis had put it in her pocketbook because he didn't want police to find him with it. Had it been? Striation marks in the barrel could have been compared to those on the bullets found in the victims and the hammer mark provided on the shell casing would be able to be compared to shell casings found at the Lafayette. As is, we may never know if this was the weapon used. Hawkins got in contact with Haggins, though initially she did not remember the night at all. Eventually, after questioning, long conversations, 
and hypnosis sessions, she started to tell a story that was very different to any that had been considered in the case so far. She claimed that Eddie Walls, the stepson of Leroy Holloway, who had been shot the day before, was one of the shooters, as was Elwood Tuck, a friend of Rubens and owner of the night spot. She claimed that she was there as well during the shooting, that she and Ruben had walked into the bar, asked for service, and it had been refused, and then, subsequent to that, Tuck and Rawls had walked in and shut up the whole place when their suspicions that this bar would not serve people of their skin colour were confirmed. This was not corroborated by the witness accounts from the victims who were definitely there. However, she also claimed that there had been two cars at the scene. Carter's white car and a black Chevy. Now, this is backed up by the testimony of one of the officers who was reporting at the scene. He testified in court that he'd seen two cars, a white car followed by a black car. And although this isn't so reliable, in one of the many stories of Alfred Bellow, he claimed that there had been multiple cars at the scene. Hawkins also quotes the testimony of another witness at the scene, who was called Ronald Francis Ruggiero. Like Patty Valentine, he lived above the bar, heard the shots and looked out of his window. He saw a white car with two black occupants, although he could not identify either of them, and he saw a man running away down the street. This man was likely Alfred Bellow. This does corroborate the idea that Bellow was in the area, though it later turned out that he'd also stolen money from the cash register, so it seemed that it was very likely that he had entered the bar shortly after the shootings had taken place through another door and exited very quickly while the men were still driving away, which suggests that his testimony of being able to identify the shooters is very unlikely to be true. The bar's on a corner and had two entrances. The men left on the Patty Valentine side and Bellow probably entered and left on the Ruggiero side, so it's highly unlikely that he would have had a good view at all. They would have had their backs to him as they were going out of the door, and you can't really get a good read on someone's face from that angle. This means that naturally his testimony must be taken into account less than that of the victims who definitely saw their faces and were definitely there. He would have had little to no time to observe them, and even if he had, it would have been a very stressful time, he would have been panicking, and that doesn't make his judgments necessarily accurate, especially given that he was unlikely to have seen their faces. Of course, the comments about not having much time to observe them and it being very stressful at the time could easily be applied to Hazel Tannis and William Marins as well, but in the case of Hazel Tannis, she looked into their eyes and pleaded for their life. I think that makes her a bit more reliable than the thief who snuck in through the other door and took some money out of the cash register. It's since been revealed that Hawkins also found a memo that had been sent to Vincent de Simone, telling him to investigate Eddie Ball, but no information suggesting that any investigation of Rawls took place has been found. Rawls was at the police station the night of the murders, at the same time as Carter and Artis were, and he failed a polygraph test. Tuck was said to have looked like Reuben, which could possibly account for Bellow's testimony and for the failed identification of Reuben by the witnesses. A rumour has also turned up since that Rawls may have confessed to the crime on his deathbed, though this is unverified. Another associate of theirs in the area, Henry Cotton, had fled Patterson just the day after the shooting. He never returned. His relative, Eddie Cotton, has said that his father thought Henry was one of those responsible. Henry knew Rawls and Tuck. There's also an account from a man named Cockershan, who lived next door to Patty Valentine. While he wasn't willing to speak to Hawkins' assistant, whose name was Prentice Thompson, his wife was, and he said that he'd seen the men, that he'd known them, and that they weren't Carter and Artis. At this point, I think I should be talking about a source of information from which I found the text of the 19 pages, which will be linked below the video. The site graphicwitness.com forward slash Carter is a very informative resource, if largely focused on defaming the character 
of Carter rather than, say, discussing the crime that was committed and who could be responsible. It's also very focused on the media perspective on the incident. As an example of this, the site has pointed out repeatedly that, unlike Dylan claims, Carter was not the number one contender for the middleweight crown, though at one point he had been, and his career was largely failing at that point. According to Carter and those around him, he had been about to embark on a training camp in order to get in shape and try to make a comeback. This is why he is quoted at some points during the night as being said to be looking for his guns. When he was on the training camps, he liked to shoot. This also explains why he would think of himself as a contender for the middleweight crown. At this point, he was trying to get his career back on track. And in boxing, from what little I know, confidence is very important in terms of form, in terms of motivation, in terms of all sorts of things. So of course, if you try and mount your comeback, you will believe that you're the contender. He could have been a contender. The site graphicwitness.com forward slash Carter also quotes him saying that he was the army's European light welterweight champion when in fact he won a different boxing title while stationed in Europe instead. There are a number of other points that could be made about the site and how it treats perspectives on Carter, but I will see to it its overall point that Carter is not a very credible or reliable source, even on matters of his own life. He has a tendency to exaggerate and to attempt to make himself look better than the actual facts show. But something that the site doesn't mention quite so much is the degree to which the facts show that Bella is unreliable, that neither murderer matched physical descriptions of Carter and Artis, and that the police did not sufficiently investigate other options. It also doesn't mention that they lied to Bella in order to get him to change his story, which resulted in the ruling of the trial as unconstitutional, and that his original identification of Reuben was under possibly coercive circumstances. Cal Deal, who runs the page, has countered some of these points. In terms of the descriptions given by the victims, he cites a police sketch drawn up next to Hazel Tannis of one of the perpetrators. There's a picture of it on the site. Some people think it looks quite a bit like John Artis. Although I would say that this is relatively weak evidence considering that she was shown a picture of him by the police and they said that she did not identify him as the shooter. In addition to this, the site claims, using quotes mainly from Bello, that it was the recantation rather than the testimony that was coerced. In this case, it suggests that it was coerced through bribery and states that the trial was ruled unconstitutional mainly because of the motive assigned, which sort of ignores any and all mention of the concealment rather than disclosure measure, which was clearly quite weighty in the overall decision, as that's the reason that the decision was upheld when the case was reassessed on appeal. The site goes into a lot of detail on the matter, at one point saying that it made no sense to say that the decision made, was made based on racism rather than reason, when two of the jurors at the second trial, and I quote, were blacks. Now, it seems to me that the words racism rather than reason in this case were referring to the assigning of the motive rather than to the verdict. The jury could have found them completely innocent, but the trial could still have been unconstitutional as a result of that motive being assigned. So, citing the ruling as evidence that racism was not involved in the decision to allow the motive in the first place is incredibly flawed reasoning. Additionally, when talking about the possibility that uh, the recantations were obtained under bribery, if you listen to Fred Hogan's descriptions in the Hurricane Tapes of the process by which he got the recantations, and if you know that Vincent D. Simone was so suspicious of these recantations that he went so far as to have Fred Hogan's mother's bank account monitored to be sure that there wasn't money coming out of it for this bribery. You probably realise that if there was bribery going on, then there would have been evidence 
and it would have been found and it would have come forward to the court. As it didn't, I very much highly doubt that there was any, particularly given that the main source for the idea that bribery could have been involved is none other than Alfred Bellow. Famously trustworthy, Alfred Bellow never changed his story, always very consistent. Outran Jarlas is over 120 yards. <sighs> if Cal will distrust Reuben's account of the day based off falsehoods he told at other times, then he must equally distrust any suggestions made by Bellow. He doesn't seem to. Yes, the man was there, but a reliable witness he is not. And as the case that Cal tends to make leans so heavily on the words and the testimony of Alfred Bellow, I naturally find the entire site somewhat doubtful. Cal has stated in an interview that the site was created in 2002 in response to the Hurricane movie starring Denzel Washington, so it makes sense that it focuses on the media portrayals as much as it does. One doesn't go through a hit song line by line looking for inaccuracies unless one's trying to challenge public perception. Cal states that he's doing this in part because of the families of the victims, yet doesn't seem to mention alternative possibilities. He brings up the 19 pages of the Hawkins report, as I mentioned earlier, but he brings it up just because it suggests that the racial revenge motive is plausible rather than as an alternate possibility. The document suggests that the racial revenge motive was plausible not because it thought it was a good motive, but in absence of all other motives. The fact that the same document suggests that they didn't in fact commit the crime is somewhat lost on Cal. Also not mentioned is the fact that Rawls was not investigated in enough depth. I appreciate that the website may be relatively old compared to this knowledge, but I'm sure the families would rather know that the investigation has been botched, rather than be increasingly certain that a man who might not have done it definitely did. Reuben was not a good person. He's alleged to have beaten up a woman who was working with him on his campaign, though there was no evidence of this, charges were dropped and it was his word against hers. He claims that she asked for money and he said no, she claims that he never did. It doesn't look good for Reuben, and I'm not saying that he was a good person, I'm just saying that I don't think he shot anyone in person that night. The site and Cal, on a whole, are also very reluctant to talk about John Artis. There is a brief point that the site makes about an unrelated later conviction for dealing cocaine, which John apparently claimed was for medicinal use, as he contracted an immune disease in prison and lost several of his fingers. The idea that he would be in some pain is very legitimate. And I don't believe I understand the point Cal is trying to make by mentioning this. Possibly he's saying that John deserved to go to prison because he became a criminal later and therefore a criminal before by virtue of some innate criminality, which seems like a slightly racist thing to suggest. Um, or possibly that as he did commit a crime, he deserved to be put in prison before that for a crime that he may not have committed. I don't really know. This seems to not really show much understanding for the fact that coming out of prison without much work experience, life experience or job prospects, particularly given that you'd still have a criminal record for a triple homicide, there wouldn't be too many options open for John going back into society. In any case, it's very hard to see what kind of point Cal is trying to make. The only times John Artis are mentioned on the main page is an article about the drug dealing conviction, um, mentions of the police sketch of his face that's somehow more accurate than the photo Hazel Tannis saw of him, and in some variant of the phrase, car for an artist. There's a slight irony that I very much enjoy, that Cal spends so much time focusing on how Reuben was not the number one contender for middleweight crown, and so little time focusing on John Artis, the man who literally could have gone on to be the champion of the world in his sport. The fact that I've spent over 1,300 words discussing one person's alternative point of view is highly indicative of the amount of confusion and the amount of discussion that you'll find going on about this case.
so many different perspectives out there. I'm trying to make this video into a discussion of the facts of the case and not a discussion of Ruben Carter. It's hard to get away from him sometimes. Such a big personality, such a loud voice, a force of nature at times, but with that it is time to move away from the story and to start talking about the evidence. On the subject of the two suspects the police believe to be the killers, Ruben Carter and John Artis, the evidence linking them to the scene is less great than it could have been. The car, which was recognised by Patty Valentine after she saw it the second time, is relatively weak when compared to the fact that the faces of the murderers were seen by two of the victims and they later went on to not identify Carter and Artis. The reason why I consider the car evidence to be weaker is that anyone can own or drive a car of a certain type or even borrow a car of a certain type from someone else. No one can change their height or their face or grow a moustache into a goatee in 10 minutes. I can't grow either of those things so I should definitely know. While the car and it matching Rubens could be taken as a sign of Rubens involvement or direct presence it should be noted that in Patterson it was common for good friends to borrow and or use each other's cars, occasionally without permission. Hurricane Tapes mentions this a couple of times, most prominently in episode 1 and episode 12. Reuben's cousin, John Carter, mentions waking up one morning to find that Reuben has stolen his car and taken it for a drive. When Carter and Artis were pulled over in Reuben's car, John was the one driving, and Reuben was driving Elwood Tuck's car when the police eventually arrested him after Bella came forward. Both Johns in episode 12 confirmed that this was relatively normal for Patterson at the time. So it is possible that someone else was in the car, drove from where Reuben left it at the night spot to the Lafayette, committed the murders, left, drove to the night spot where it was, maybe someone else was involved and picked the murderers up in, say, a black Chevy once they'd dropped off the white car, it's just a possibility, and from there the night could have transpired exactly as both Reuben and the police suggest. Reuben, John and Royster getting into the car, driving Royster home, getting stopped by the police on the way, and getting stopped again on the way back. Of course this wouldn't be exactly the same in both the suspects and the police's timelines. In the police's timeline they suggest a drop-off where Carter and Artis would stop the car, get rid of the guns, possibly get rid of any bloody clothing, clean the car of any blood that they might have got in it on their shoes, and just in general clean up, hide as much of the evidence as they could. They suggest that this would take place at the apartment of Eddie Rawls. But dropping clothes and guns off at Rawls's apartment makes little sense as he was in for questioning that night as well. Surely as he was a suspect his apartment would be the last place that you would think this is where I shall leave the evidence. It doesn't really make much sense there. Additionally having clothes there already for them to change into suggests that this would be a highly coordinated and premeditated affair which just doesn't make sense with John Artis's involvement. He didn't know any of the people involved. He was just someone who liked to go to the clubs and the bars and dance. He asked a man for a lift home. I believe that's what he did. Especially given the fact that they didn't know each other. If there had been a drop-off, why would Artis not chuck Carter under the bus? Why would Royston not chuck Carter under the bus? I mean, that's presuming, of course, that John Artis didn't have a motive to kill three people and shoot a fourth that he'd never met before in revenge for the death of somebody he didn't know. I mean, that would seem like a sensible presumption, but you never know. Anyway, back to the evidence. The evidence we have does not necessarily connect Carter and Artis to the car at the time of the killings. It connects the car to the killings, 
cut an artist to the car, but the timeline doesn't necessarily work. It connects to the car to the scene and the car to the murderers, but not necessarily the murderers to John and Ruben. Why this sticks out to me a lot is because they don't match the physical descriptions. I know I keep coming back to this, but when you're looking at a case where people saw someone shoot them, survived, went on to, in one case, discuss it in court, and in another case, went on to look at photos and say that it wasn't them, then if they cannot confirm that these are the people, then they are very, very likely to not be the people. It's the major hang up in any theory that puts them at the scene or as the murderers. If the prosecution proposes a link between the car and car to an artist, and proposes a link between the shooting and the car, but it fails to establish a link between car to an artist at the time of the shooting and the scene at the time of the shooting, specifically in an area where boring cars and other people using one another's cars was quite common, then they have failed to establish a solid enough link to properly determine that they were the murderers, in my opinion. Additionally, judging by the prosecution's own map and timeline, again, found on Cal's site, which I'm very grateful for, they reckon that after the murder, it took Ruben and John five minutes to go what looks from the key to be about 0.6 miles from the Lafayette to the light spot. And in that time, they would have picked up John Buck's Royster. So that's not very far. In the second proposition, they suggest that in the next five minutes, they would have driven about 0.4 miles or so, and that would have been counting a stop at Rawls's apartment to make the drop off. So that would be let's see, discarding guns, but not all of the ammunition in the car for some reason, leaving the car, changing out of presumably bloody clothes. Again, a member of the ambulance crew had slipped in the blood earlier. Um, I think the police proposed at this point that Ruben had changed into a distinctive white smoking jacket of his. I think the suggestion there is if he'd been wearing that at the time that it would have been covered in blood. So obviously he must have put it on afterwards and that's the time in which they say he would have put it on. So they would be cleaning bloody clothes, they'd be disposing of them, they'd be clearing the car of some blood because if you sit in a car in bloody clothes you'll get blood on the car and no blood was found in the car so they must have cleaned it of blood in this five minute period. Well it must have been very fast that clean up if this is what actually happened, mustn't it? I'm not sure even Winston Wolf could manage that. That's that's definitely faster than Pulp Fiction. And all at the same time as this changing clothes, disposing of evidence, wiping down the car, they also probably would have had to make sure that Royster didn't notice what he was going on. The man was drunk, yes, but supposedly they had him in the car in case police came round and we're looking for two people in the car. That's why he's la labelled alibi witness in the police's document. I think he would be, in that state, quite unreliable. You couldn't exactly say, oh yes, this person would be perfectly aware of everything that was happening around them, but I imagine a drunk person would have a few questions about the guns and the changing and that sort of thing. And that's not necessarily the kind of person you want to be interviewed by police. And if he's only there so that if the police come along, you'll have an extra person. If that extra person is just like, oh man, did you see all that blood? Then you're screwed, so you might as well not have the extra person. So it doesn't really make any sense to have Royster there if this is this, you know, seamless plan with the rapid changing of clothes and hiding of evidence and all that. It would have to be a fast operation, highly organised, the prosecution claimed that the police saw them speeding there, so that wouldn't take them very long at all to get there when considering that it took them, what, 0.4 miles? Here's a question. They sped away from the Lafayette. This is confirmed by Patty Valentine. Sped away from the Lafayette. So say they then got back to the night spot, picked up Royster, drove for, like, not very much time, and then was spotted by the police car that saw them speeding. So that would have to be a very slow pickup of Royster. At 30 miles per hour, 
that 0.5 to 0.6 mile drive would take one minute. At 15 miles per hour, it would take two, and yet they were seen speeding. So what were they doing for the remaining three to four minutes? If all you're doing is picking up a drunk person, why is it taking that long? The timeline just doesn't flow. You can't say, oh, these people were so professional. They hid the evidence and changed out of bloody clothes and put on the new clothes that they'd stashed there and also say, oh yeah, they took about four minutes to get a drunk man in a car. Like, the timeline just doesn't line up. The prosecution are trying to have it both ways and say, oh, this was a highly polished operation and say, well, they took quite a bit of time at this bit and to be honest, they could have been seen there and in the white car and that would have been pretty damning because they probably wouldn't have cleaned up at that point. You know, it's ridiculous. I don't understand it. Well, I don't understand the prosecution's proposition. Looking at the timeline, had the real killers dropped Ruben's car off at the night spot and then left it with their clothes and their guns, maybe thrown them into another car, maybe a black Chevy, there is theoretically enough time for Reuben and John to come out of the night spot, find the car, get in it and start to drive Royster home. Possibly John would speed, as I don't believe he'd been behind the wheel of such an expensive car before, and I think there's a chance that they would have to slow down to get directions to Royce's house from him, as he wasn't in the best state, and in a car going that fast, you really don't want someone who's blackout drunk to be reeling all over the place and vomiting and trying to tell you where the house is. Another possible explanation for the slow down before they were eventually found by the police. Could be that they took a wrong turn, got lost, or even went back on themselves. And that would line up with the timeline of the 240 meeting. It's even possible that a different car sped past and was seen by police, and Ruben, John and Royster passed by afterwards. But in any case, it's clear that if the killers had taken this route, they would have got to the night spot between 231 and 232, and left around 234. For a group that then goes on to take two to three minutes to stash guns, communicate with one another, talk to walls about what happened and what to do, change clothes and possibly clean a car. That first two to three minute wait seems very slow. Almost as if it was just dropping the car there and walking away and that was where the killers left it. It also seems unfair of the prosecution to suggest that Carter and Artis picked up Royster in order to throw off the police so that there would be three men in the car instead of two. When the police actually came up to Ruben's car, Ruben himself wasn't easily seen, so it looked like there were two men in the car. He was lying down on the back seat, and when they came up to them, he sat up. Incidentally, Caldeal's site also talks about this, saying that Ruben was lying down in the back of the car to hide, while at the same time saying that they wanted three people in the car so that it would be less suspicious to the police. It's, it's ridiculous. It's having it both ways. Again. So, in my view at least, the car and the bullets don't seem that reliable anymore. People in the area borrow cars from one another regularly, and the prosecution's timeline suggests a great deal of precision at one point and a great deal of imprecision at one point because they're trying to force events to fit the narrative that they think makes the most sense and will get them the conviction. Who knows, it's also possible that Reuben wasn't aware of the murder itself, but did lend his car to a friend or two. Perhaps these friends were Tuck and Rawls and he didn't know what they would go on to do. It makes sense to me that hating the police as he did and loyal to his friends, he would then go on to refuse to comply with the investigation. This tendency for non-compliance was noted several times in Hurricane Tapes and a cultural tendency to band together and deny information to the police seems from these witness testimonies to be to have been commonplace in Patterson at the time. Even the police, the prosecution and Cal rely on this idea that the people of Patterson would not conform with the police's investigation to suggest that Carter's associates, people that said he was with them on the night, were defending him because they disliked the police rather than possibly him defending some of his friends for the same reason. 
I'm not saying that this happened. I'm only saying that there is a reasonable doubt. And linking him to the bullets and the shooting via the car is highly questionable. I guess that's what it comes down to. When you don't have biological evidence, when you don't have blood on his clothes, when you don't have blood on his car, you're linking them to the car, the car to the scene, and the car to the murderers. But the link between him and the murderers has not been made adequately to suggest beyond a reasonable doubt that he was guilty. As far as I can see, there's no way to link Ruben to the scene other than via the car. And without proper investigation of Eddie Walls, Albert Tuck and Henry Cotton, it's impossible to come to any concrete conclusions or even to know to what extent, if at all, Ruben was involved. That said, I will attempt to come to some conclusions. Overall, I think I've made it relatively clear what I think happened. There's insufficient evidence to have convicted Ruben and John, and the fact that they were convicted regardless does not change that. The car and the bullets aren't necessarily a link, and even taking them at the strongest possible measure, that guarantees nothing when the witnesses directly did not identify Reuben and John as the people who were shot. The witnesses had said that the taller man was at best six foot. Reuben was six foot, and John towered over Reuben. Moustaches rather than goatees and photos not investigated tell the rest of the story. They were not at the Lafayette. Or at the very, very least, John wasn't. Incidentally, the first thing he did when he got out was to go visit the Lafayette Bar and Grill. He'd never been and wanted to see what the place that had ruined his life was like. That's not the action of a guilty man. And neither is Rubens. Once he was released, after a while that he spent with a Canadian slightly cult-like group, shall we say, he got involved in charity work, helping and campaigning for people who had been wrongfully imprisoned. Would he have done that if he was guilty the whole time? I don't think so. I will caveat this with the fact that this is my opinion, but at least to me it does seem quite clear. The failure to investigate other possibilities seems to suggest a high level of incompetence by the police, as does the prosecution's failure to accept or even consider other possibilities, which honestly suggests that they may have been too focused on Reuben and John to be objective. When you're not considering the idea that the friend of Reuben, the bartender at the night spot, Eddie Walls, whose anger they believed had led to Reuben committing the murders, was not himself investigated for those murders. Questions have to be asked. It's a bit tricky to discuss conclusions without reiterating about a dozen things I've already said, mostly in the evidence section, or just mentioned tangentially while talking through the facts of the case. One thing I don't think I have mentioned yet is that the police very much did not like Reuben Carter, and at least one ex-policeman strongly believes that he was framed. I believe that John had no involvement. I don't know whether or not I believe that Reuben was involved. It's more possible that he was than that John was, but several factors do lead me to doubt his involvement. But those words will never be enough to convince me that the victim did not identify him. Reuben Carter was falsely tried. And Bob Dylan, who wrote the song Hurricane in Reuben's honour, though he hasn't performed it, though prior to his death he hadn't performed it in many years. Is he dead? I'm not sure if he's dead. <laughs> she was questioned about the incident eight days later and said that the man named Roosevelt Davis, Roosevelt Davis, Roosevelt Davis, Hawkins also quotes the testimony of another witness at the scene, who was called Ronald Francis Ruggiero. Ronald, Ronald, Roosevelt, Ronald, 